After a hockey scholarship brought him to the University of Alabama, Graham Fair, a Canadian born and raised in British Columbia, graduated with an MBA and soon landed a job in the heart of New York's financial district. On July 8, 1996, he began his new career in an office just a few blocks away from the World Trade Center towers. Five years later, he would be an eyewitness to one of the most pivotal events in recorded history. I clearly remember the morning because, interestingly, we, we weren't doing a lot of hiring at the time. And, and I had a, a guy that I worked with on the brokerage side. He was going to be joining us in technology that, that morning. And it was a morning that we were kind of preparing for because we had to get him sorted out with, with what machine he was going to be sitting at and all the stuff that goes along with, with this guy's new position. And so he was looking towards me when I was sitting at my desk and he says, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't know there was a parade going on today. And it was kind of odd because we saw a lot of like full pieces of paper kind of floating by my window. And So we both looked out there and didn't really think a whole lot of it. Graham's office at the time was located at 80 Pine Street, which is roughly two blocks from the water and about half a block from Wall Street, and was in clear view of the towers, especially from the trading floor. At this point, the news was falsely reporting that a small commuter plane had hit one of the towers. I thought, well, let me just go out to the trading floor because I know I can see the uh, the towers from from there. And so I went out and all the brokers are kind of milling around by the window. And I'm like, everyone starts saying, you know, that doesn't look like a small plane and all that. We started seeing smoke and there was smoke billowing kind of down, not horribly at that point, but it was, you could see it kind of floating through the area. And what I was looking at from the trading floor, and this is after the first plane hit, I, I was looking right into the first hole, basically, of where the plane went in. And what I saw on the TVs was the exact same vantage point as what I was seeing from the trading floor. So basically there was a helicopter close to where we were that was shooting in on the on the plane. And everyone on the, on the trading floor was basically, they were looking inside a gaping hole in one of the towers. And then I thought, you know, let me go back and, and give my wife a call again. So I, right when I turned my back, the, the second plane had hit. When that second plane hit, the entire trading floor just started scattering and everyone started like just making a beeline to the uh, to the staircase. I ran into my, my office and I grabbed my work bag. And so I just, I took that with me, but I just followed everybody and went down the stairs. And at the time, people are tr- we were trying to stay, stay calm, but the more that there was stories about, you know, terrorism this, terrorism that, and, you know, for those of us who haven't been introduced to a whole lot of terrorism in our lives, you know, I w- start, you started to ask questions like, you know, what the, what the hell could this mean to everybody? And so I thought that regardless of where everyone was flowing to, I was going to go down as close as I could to the water. Graham ran the few blocks to the water to an area basically between the Staten Island Ferry Dock and a shopping area called the South Street Seaport. That turned out to be a spot that everybody was was flowing to, even from um, buildings it seemed that were were closer to the towers than we were. It just seemed like people had the same thought in mind, like, let's get down to, you know, A, maybe where there's some transportation, and B, as far away as we can on foot to to where, where the towers are. Um, and so I saw a few people from the office and like, hey, what's going on? And a couple of the guys were, they were saying that they, they were hearing reports that it was terrorism and that there was reports of other planes going down. And then honestly, we, we really didn't know what to think next. And so we, we kind of hung around to see what was going to be happening. And when we were down um, near the water, you know, deciding what to do after that first tower went down, the plume of smoke came down the road so quickly that when we were standing there, like you were obviously engulfed in some some smoke in that. But um, when small little pieces of the metal was were hitting our skin and they were so hot, like they were burning your skin because they, you know, it was they were still hot from from however you know long it took for that smoke and so forth to get down all the different uh, streets. And if you see the pictures of it, it basically just used all the streets as like arteries for exhausting all of the uh, all the smoke from where they where the In the initial pandemonium after the first tower fell, Graham found himself in a precarious situation. He made a decision that in hindsight probably saved his life. We were getting so close to the water that people were thinking like, you know, should we jump in the water and and are there spots that we can like get onto on docks and things like that. But where I was standing, the next closest place would have been to jump into the water at that point, which I probably wouldn't have made it if I did it because it was, there was just too much going on for rescue and all that that it, you you probably wouldn't have survived because of how rough the water is and just nowhere to grab yourself up but i was actually on the other side of the, the barricaded fence that protects you know regular street goers on normal days from the water and i was on the on the other side of it hanging on to it with one hand and kind of leaning towards the water on the other and, it, and i just decided at that point that i saw people heading up um 
heading up the FDR, which takes you along the the east side of uh, of Manhattan. And so I jumped back over the fence and I basically just started running up the uh, up the FDR. I actually ended up running up with a guy who uh, we we happened to both be in marathon training at the time, so we we had a pretty good pace going. We we chatted you know a lot of the way and and we tried to make best plans as far as what would be the smartest thing to do. And I think at one point he branched off before I did, and I I kept going because I still didn't know what was going on. Aside from an impromptu cab ride. Graham mostly traveled by foot up the east side and soon found himself on the 59th Street Bridge. So there, you know, there was tons of people from the Midtown area that were, that were getting on that bridge. Um, and it was so just, you know, people running and some people screaming or whatever. And some of the screaming and that had died down from the downtown area. But I'd made my way quite, quite a ways at that point where you're out of the downtown bit, but I'm still not really knowing what's going on. So when I made my way across, um, as I made my way through Queens and Brooklyn um, to get up to what they call the um, the Gowanus Expressway, um, which is it's a roadway that basically leads all of the, the most of the people from Brooklyn and Staten Island towards the Battery Tunnel, um, that, uh, that where people commute into the city into the downtown area. And so uh, it took a while, and uh, and I made my way, and um, still by foot, and most of like mostly running and when I eventually made it to the uh, to the Verrazano Bridge which is what connects Staten Island to um, to, to Brooklyn um, and, and I lived just on the other side of the Verrazano Bridge um, they weren't allowing people to go over on foot and so I jumped in with some guy in a truck and he took me across the Verrazano and dropped me off on the on the base of the road that, that I that I used to live on and so then I, I just you know walked or ran the rest of the rest of the way which then I saw my family and all of that. Obviously, this is an experience he will never forget. But we asked Graham if there was one aspect that is forever ingrained in his psyche. The sound of the towers made when they came down was something that, it, it was the one real nightmare that I had afterwards. It was a sound that just kind of rung in your head, the destruction that was happening when, when they were coming down. It was, just, it was a crumpling, kind of crippling sound that just kind of freaked you out.